I was teasing Adam this morning that he was supposed to preach, and I asked him if he got my email, and he said no. I said, well, must have went, must have went to your junk mail, and so, you know, you guys got to check your emails. You never know. You never know. You're going to be asked to preach or, you know, come up here. I am going to work faithfully each week on my cord winding skills. There we go. Hi. Good morning. I am excited to be here with you this morning. As Theo mentioned, Erin and Aaliyah um, are at Covenant Grove this morning um, because she's graduating confirmation. They do it for two years there, and so she's finishing up her second year. Um, So it's exciting for them to be able to celebrate that together, but so good that we're united together no matter which building we're in or whether you're watching at home, we are together in this. We're going to continue through our sermon series in uh, Genesis. So we're kind of on week three. The first week was an overview and an introduction, and then last week Aaron preached through uh, Genesis 1, and I wanted just to be able to take a moment and give you some key terms that we're going to be using throughout the sermon series and it's important uh, that, you, that you have those locked in and uh, so we don't have to try to explain them, you know, every week. Um, the first one uh, thing that I just want to just make sure that we understand is that we are approaching Genesis from a different perspective. This is a, a posture shift, a, per, a perspective shift. The first uh, thing is that we are looking at it from a Jewish perspective, an Eastern perspective. We are Western. We're Greek thinking perspective. So it is a shift. And um, the second thing is we want to understand how they read and under stood the text, understand the context in which it was written. And in that, then, that different, that different perspective, we want to understand how God is revealed, and in that, we understand who we are. Um, the second thing that we need to understand, just kind of lock in as we're going through Genesis, is this term chiasm. And there's a couple ways you could say chiasmus, chiasm, chiasic, chiastic, Um, all different forms of this word, but it's essentially this. I'm a visual learner, and I told Aaron after last week, I was like, you need to put a visual up (laughs) because I need to see a visual. A visual is, uh, so for a chiasm or chiasmus, this is one form of it. So you could have A, B, C, D, and then there's the center point in which it can turn around D, C, B, A. Or another form of a chiasm could be A, B, C, D, and then there's a turnaround, and then A, B, C, D. And, those, and the A's correspond with each other, and the B's correspond with each other. And so scholars have looked through, and they've been able to find all these chiasms because there's deep, deep meaning embedded in them. It was also just a mnemonic device for them. They, they didn't have scrolls that they were writing down, so it helped them memorize. And they could always get to that point, that key nugget within the story that they would carry with them. Um, And so understand this term chiasmus or chiasm, we'll use those throughout it. Last week, Aaron introduced Genesis 1, and this was the chiasm that he was talking about. And so Genesis 1, I won't go into a ton of detail, but if you look at it, it started with day 1, day 2, day 3. There was the center point, and then it it went back down again. At the center of Genesis 1, reading from a Jewish perspective, was this idea that God was inviting his people to a day of rest. We know that on the seventh day God rested, but the center point, there was this idea that God was saying, you are a people of rest, and you need to start your day with rest. Speaking to uh, the Hebrews back then that had been enslaved and enlabored for 400 years, that must have been amazing to hear, that God was inviting them to be not a beast of burden, but a people of Sabbath rest. And so that was just a quick snapshot of last week, Genesis 1. Today we're going to breeze through Genesis 2 and 3. And so you'll see this visual throughout the day. This is the chiastic or the chiasm for Genesis 2 through the end of chapter 3. And at the center point, we're really going to focus on where that D is right there, Genesis 2, 25. That's the nugget that, uh, that we were going to get out of this chiasm. And there are many chiasms um, in, in this text, and we'll reference a few of them as well. There's like chiasms within chiasms. 
Um, but we want to find this nugget of truth uh, that, that God has for us today. So we're going to shift our perspective. Uh, Aaron talked about last week standing in a room. If you were standing outside the church looking in those windows right there, you would see the back of all of your heads, right? And, you're, and as if you're describing the room, you would say, I see that head and that head and that person, that person. And the person sitting over there goes, no, 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 no. I see this and I see this and I see this. Are they wrong? Are they wrong? No. They are seeing exactly what they're supposed to see from their perspective. Are they seeing the room? Absolutely. So it doesn't matter that we're shifting our perspective. We are focusing 100% on the word and we are focusing on the truth that is there and has always been there. All right. Are you ready? Awesome. Okay. I'm ready. Okay. So I'm going to pray and I'm going to pray for me. So you pray for me, I'll pray for me. More so, I want God to be revealed this morning. Let's pray for that. Father, I am yours. And like every other person in this room or people that are watching online, we are your children. And more importantly, God, this is your word. Passed down from generation to generation, people to people. And though, although written thousands of years ago, specifically to the Hebrews, God, your word is for us. And so, Lord, I pray that your spirit speaks louder than me. I pray, God, that you are heard louder than me. God, I pray that as your people, we, we will receive and take the truth that you have for us and that we could apply it to our lives so that you, God, may be glorified in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, here we go. We're going to look at Genesis 2 and 3. And one of the things about Jewish perspective that's really interesting, they read it differently. They actually are looking for the things that are a little bit out of place in the story. And those things that are out of place, those things that are kind of odd, those are the clues to the nugget that they're trying to find, the truth that they're trying to find embedded in the scripture. And so as we read today, I may be calling out like, is there something weird about that? What did you catch? So don't be afraid to uh, yell it out. Just say, you know, just kind of yell it out and, and I'll say it over the mic so everybody can hear. So last week we looked at a creation story, and again we read that, that there was a nugget of truth in there, different perhaps than what you've studied before, but this nugget of Sabbath rest. And in Genesis 2 and 3, we have actually another creation story. Why another creation story? Why two? Well, because the author is trying to tell us something different in this one. In fact, chapter 1 and chapter 2 don't actually line up. If you were to try to read them that way, the timings are different. And, and so you have to read them and go, okay, well, there's something different about what God wants us to get out of chapter 2. Last week, like I said, we learned about that Sabbath rest. And so we have this chiastic structure again. Go ahead and pull that one back up, Peggy. So, uh, nope, nope, the curvy one. There we go. Genesis 2 and 3, that center point, Genesis 2, 25. So if you don't have your Bibles open, go ahead and get there because we're going to be reading through the bulk of chapter 3 together. But I want to be able to outline chapter 2 because the chiasm, they all go together. They all go together. So we're going to outline chapter 2. And you check your word. I'm not leading you astray or anything. So when we look at verses 5 through 15... We see this upward slope in that chiasm. It's God at work. God's at work in this story. So we see that the earth and the heavens are created, but there's no plants or grains yet. There's no rainwater and there's no people yet. We see that God forms man with dust and breathes life into him. There's a whole sermon in that all in itself. And we see that there's a garden called Eden and it's planted and it now has trees and there's fruit. Especially, we learned about the tree of life and the tree of knowledge and the tree of good and evil. We also learned somewhat randomly that there's four rivers that are flowing through Eden watering the garden. In verse 16 and 17, chapter 2, we see that the man is in the garden to watch over it. We see that he's warned, he can eat freely, but he's warned to not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then in verse 18 through 24, for the first time, we actually see that something is not good. It's not good. 
that man is alone. And so God creates animals, and he brings them to the man that he can name them, and among them there still wasn't a good enough helper. And so God creates woman out of man, and they are intended to be united. And here's where we hit the center of the chiasm. And here's this verse, and we have to figure it out. Now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. You can imagine preparing a sermon this morning going, how am I going to talk about nakedness all morning long? (laughs) Awkward, right? Uh, I chose not to talk about nakedness all morning long. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. And I am, uh, you know, not encouraging you to, like, you know, take this literally. Okay, right now, right now, whatever. Okay, so it's an odd statement, though, right? So you have this God is creating, and then you have this statement right in the middle about them being naked. Now, even in ancient times, that would be an odd statement. And they felt no shame. So keep that in the back of your mind as we continue to journey through the story. We've reached the pinnacle, and now we're going to see a tangible shift. Up to this point, God has been at work, and now we're going to be introduced to another character in the story who is also going to work, and this is the serpent. So follow me, read with me chapter 3. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did, you, did God really say that you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat from the, fruit, from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's, it's only the fruit from the trees in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it, and if you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced and she saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. And then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. There's that word again. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden, and so they hid from the Lord God among the trees. And then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And he replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid because I was, a, I was naked. Who told you that you were naked? The Lord God asked, have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? And the man replied, it it was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit and I ate it. And then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? And the serpent, the serpent deceived me, she replied, that's why I ate it. And then the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. And then he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy and in pain you will give birth. And you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. And to the man he said, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you. You will eat of its grains. By the sweat of your brow, you will have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust and to dust you will return. So the first half of the chiasm, we saw God at work. And the second half of the chiasm, we see sin at work through the serpent. But again, we return to 25. The two of them, the man and his wife, were naked, but they felt no shame. Why this verse? Because this is a definition of what it means to be human. 
the man and the woman in their perfect form as God intended them to be. They were united, they were naked, and they were unashamed. Oh, if the story could have just stopped there. And again, I'm not advocating that we run around naked right now, but we must understand what it actually means to be human. Perhaps a more helpful word to help us understand the significance of the word naked would be a posture of freedom, maybe unhindered, unbound. I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel pretty bound when, you know, after I eat a good dessert and my pants get too tight, right? Clothes are not freeing, but being unbound, naked, unclothed, unashamed, See, this was God's intention for their lives and for our lives. So again, this lesson is quite significant as we're talking to the Hebrew people who've been enslaved for over 400 years, barely recognized as human. In fact, more so considered to be a beast of burden. So an affirmation of their humanity was a welcome message, and it was one that was taught repeatedly. You are not a beast. You are seen. You are mine. I created you. You are not your function. You are not what you do. You are not what you produce. You are human made in the image of God. In Genesis 3, They are fully human. They are separate from the earth. They are separate from the sea. They are separated from the rest of creation. And God said that it was good in Genesis 1. And they are separate from the beasts. Because Adam was even charged with naming all of them. So again, this is what it means to be human. United, naked, free, unashamed, in perfect relationship with God and each other. Now, I said that there was two chiasms in this, and that chiasms within chiasms in these chapter. There's another chiasm, and we're going to find the center point in chapter 3, verse 7, if you want to turn this. I told you that nakedness was mentioned several times in these verses, and again, it seems like an odd reference. You caught it, right? It showed itself many times. You're like, they keep talking about naked, well, if we're looking at that chiasm, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 7 says, At that moment, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt ashamed at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover them. What happened? How did we go from this perfect definition of what it means to be human, united, naked, and unashamed? Well, what happened was the snake entered the story. Now, so far, the story has been good, but there's now this curious creature. So I told you I was going to ask you, anything curious about the snake stood out to you? This is where you can call it out. We read the story all the time. So we kind of like, yeah, the snake. Anything curious? He was walking, number one, right? He was talking. <laughs> You're like, oh, snakes talk. I'm sorry. If I go out on a walk and the snake's talking to me, I... <laughs> that's not right. That's not normal. There's something about this snake that obviously isn't the way that we understand snakes today. It's, it's, it's like it's an animal, but it's not an animal. See, the snake, it, it reasons. It's intelligent. It's logical, and it's walking, and it seems awfully human for being a beast. And so what does the snake do? How do we get from this beautiful unity, nakedness, and unashamed to this disunity, clothed in shame? He tapped into something that he knew that they already had. And he uses their desires against them. And the temptation here is to be nothing more than a beast. 
When you consider the animals, when you think of animals today, we think of you know, basic instincts that animals might have. There's certain behaviors that are hardwired into them as animals. We have some hummingbirds that have made their nest right outside on our porch, and it's so beautiful to watch this mother hummingbird. She's got two tiny little uh, birds in her nest, and instinctually, Every day, she's flying in and out. She's gathering food, and she brings it back 24 se- Well, not 24-7. I don't know what she does at night because I'm in bed. So, but she's working because it's her instinct to lay the eggs, to sit on the eggs, to care for the eggs. And when they hatch, she will feed them. She's looking pretty skinny herself. Why? Because she's giving of herself to these baby birds. And instinctually, at some point, we're anxiously watching these birds get ready to start flexing their wings and instinctually to stand on the edge of their, of their t- tiny little nest and someday fly. And we just hope our dogs aren't out there when they get ready to do that. Because they're birds. And birds instinctually will do these things. Beasts, hardwired into them. You don't see a lion waking up in the morning and go, oh, what do I want to eat today? I wonder if I'm going to get an antelope or maybe a rabbit. No, it just wakes up and it says, I'm going to find food. Or I'm going to mate. Or maybe I just ate a big meal the night before and so it's my season of rest. Animals have these instincts. And so to Eve... The serpent's temptation is actually, be like me. Don't worry about that human thing. Just go ahead and go with your desires and be like me, the beasts. Eve, you're just a beast. You have desires in you. Let me tell you what beasts do when they have desires. Beasts act on their desires every single time. You'll never find a beast practicing self-restraint. Will you? I mean, I got dogs. I feed my dogs in the morning, and I got one dog, Bruce, who's like, and if I, he'd eat the whole bowl if I put more food in there. I have to measure out his food. Otherwise, he's just going to eat. I found this video, and I couldn't upload it, but it was a cat that um, came up on my Facebook stream, and the stuff was called cat crack, and it was like catnip. And this cat was like face in, like eating this food. And the woman couldn't even get her cat's face out of the jar. And the cat started clawing at her. She was trying to get the jar away from the cat. Why? It's a cat. The cat's not going to go, I think I've had enough now. So the serpent tricks Eve again. Be like me, the beast. Give in to your desires. See, desires are tricky things because we are hard, hardwired with them. We are created with them. God gave them desires. And when we desire, we have these strong feelings. We want, perhaps we even need. Desire is intended to be a good thing. Desire motivates us. Desires help us. Our desires can change depending on our circumstances. So if I'm sitting at home in 100 degree heat, I might desire to sit by a pool and read a nice book. If I'm living in an impoverished community without running water and a daily allowance for food, I might desire just the slightest drink of fresh water so that I can live today. Both desires, and they're meant for us. God gave them to us. And so it was desire that Satan twists. It was desire that tempted Jesus. And in the garden, it's desire is what's used to tempt Adam and Eve. Because in 3-7, at the moment their eyes were open, they suddenly felt ashamed at their nakedness, so they sewed fig leaves together because they gave in to their desire to eat of the fruit in the garden. And so the outcome again is divided, naked, and ashamed. Desire without boundary becomes temptation, sin, brokenness, and shame. And so being human, 
means to understand our desires and be able to know when to say enough. I'm done. That's not healthy. That's not the right limit. That's not good for me. Avoid that completely. There's a desire, but it has to be enough. And so where does enough come from? And it's important to know this because it's enough that separates us from the beasts. Enough comes from God. As you're reading, uh, if you're listening to the Bema podcast, there's a ton more of information in this. But in the Bema podcast, it brings up the name El Shaddai. El Shaddai means God Almighty. That's the, probably the definition that you're most, most used to. But in the podcast, the teacher says, if you actually take the word El Shaddai syllabically, it actually means the God who knows when to say enough. That's the God that we were introduced to last week in Genesis 1. The God that knew when he was done creating and he said it was good and it was actually very good. The God that knew when it was time to rest. The God that knew when to say enough. And so if that's the God that knows when to say enough and we are made in his image, What separates us, what makes us truly human, is that we know when to say enough. He is the God of self-control. How good it is then that when our desires overwhelm us, that when our desires get the best of us, that we have a God that gave us a promise. And it's found in these verses. It's another chiasm. See, the serpent has a consequence. And after they gave in to their desires, God says to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Who is that? Do you know who that is? That's Jesus. That is a prophecy in the middle of Genesis 2 that points to the fact that we gave in to our desires as humans. And God says, I've already got it. I'm going to send a man who's going to crush the head of the serpent. And the serpent does, strikes Jesus' heel, and we know that he died on the cross for us and defeated sin and death. In the middle of Genesis 2, God gives us grace already. That's a messianic promise. It right smack dab in the middle of the problem. So as we dug for that little treasure, as we go back in, as we define what it is to be human, made in the image of God, God is crying out to us, saying in the midst of our desires, God says, I am enough. I'm a God that knows how to say enough, and you're created in my image. The two of them, man and woman, were naked, but they felt no shame. They were enough, perfectly human. So God invites us to submit our desires to him, and he continues to provide a way. See, he sent his only son, defeated sin and death, who showed us that he too could overcome his desires as he was tempted by the enemy. But he also sent his spirit. In Galatians, it says, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit for our own lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. How good is it then that we can now take of this fruit that is offered to us freely 
the fruit of the Spirit that helps us contain our desires the way that God intended them to be, we have self-control. God says, in me you have all that you need. Don't let your desires tempt you to be anything other than what I would have for you because you're made in my image. You are enough. God says, I am enough. May our self-control be the evidence of Christ in us. This week, may we know when to say enough. The choir has been leading us in a benediction the last couple of weeks. I want to invite you to stand. I want to sing very simply this benediction together. And my prayer for us before we leave today, just remember that word, enough. Remember that in the nugget of Genesis 2 and 3 is that you are made in God's image. And that he is blessing you. That he is keeping you. That his face shines upon you as you go out into the world. And let our self-control be evidence to the world that we have a God that is in us. So I'm going to invite you to sing this. It might be new to you. Choir people it might be a little different too, but let's sing this together. It goes like this. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. We're going to sing amen. 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 Sing that again. Amen. 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 May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Church, amen.